Family Theater presents Alan Young and Patricia Neal. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater Incorporated, brings you Alan Young in Frank Stockton's My Terminal Moraine. To introduce our story, your hostess, Patricia Neal. Thank you, Jean. Perhaps one of the most delightful pens that ever put words on paper belonged to a man whose name was Frank R. Stockton. His short stories and novels had the late 19th century United States laughing and chuckling from coast to coast. While his best known work is undoubtedly The Lady or the Tiger, the story we're going to present tonight, titled My Terminal Moraine, is much more representative of the man and his wonderfully unbelievable, believable characters, and his sheer heartwarming whimsy and humor. Our star, Alan Young, will appear as the unforgettable hero, Walter Cuthbert, in Frank R. Stockton's unforgettable novelette, My Terminal (laughs) Moraine. Well, I was certainly the unluckiest man in the world. Really unlucky. Imagine the situation I was in. 28 years of age and single. I owned a large house and 40 acres of land, free and clear. I had a small independent income and my days were so filled with hunting and fishing that there was no time left in which to work. Yes, I was undoubtedly the unluckiest man in the world. You see, it was my new neighbors who bought the 700 acres next to mine, and... But let me tell you how I met them, and you'll soon understand what I mean. One lovely spring day, I was wandering near the fence line of our properties, deeply engrossed in thought, when my mental cerebrations were interrupted. Hello there. Yeah? Who? Oh. <laughs> Why, hello. You're Mr... Walter Cuthbert, are you not? Cuthbert? Walt? Yes, well, yes, yes, that's Walter Cuthbert is me. I, I mean I. I. I'm Miss Agnes Havelock. I think you're very nice. Y- oh, you, you do? Yes, in spite of everything my father has said about you. Well, I'm delighted that he... <laughs> hmm? Now, don't you worry, Mr. Cuthbert. Don't you worry about a thing. All right, I won't. I... Worry about what? We'll get along just famously, won't we? Why, certainly, of course we. Things will work out just fine, Mr. Cuthbert. You wait and see. Just fine. Well, goodbye now, Mr. Cuthbert. And remember, don't worry about a thing. Oh, goodbye, Miss, uh, Miss Havilet. And don't you worry. No, not about a, about a thing. (laughs) It was inevitable, of course. The impact of such a romantic meeting could have but one result. I found myself deeply, madly, unbearably in love with it. Certainly you realize now why I was so unlucky. You don't? Why, it's perfectly obvious. The girl's father, of course. After all, when a man comes up to you craftily concealing his real intent behind a torrent of honeyed words, what else could you expect? Of all the inconsiderate, ungrateful, boorish, incompetent nincompoops I've ever had the misfortune to encounter, you, sir, you, Walter Cuthbert, head the list. Thank you, sir, but I I don't believe I've had the pleasure of an introduction. The pleasure? Pleasure, indeed. Do you know who I am, young man? I just said I don't... Of course I am, exactly. J. Ascot Terwilliger Havilot. Your new neighbor, sir. Well, Mr. Havelock, may I welcome you to this lovely... Welcome, indeed. No wonder you'll welcome me, you... You fortune hunter. Fortune hunter? Oh, so you admit it, do you? Why, why, I I don't... The brazen impudence, the confounded gall admitting to my face your nefarious designs on my daughter Agnes and on my fortune. Your daughter? So that's who she is. Ha! I beg your pardon? I said ha. Oh, oh. Yes, of course you did. (laughs) Well, just let me tell you this, young man. The only way you'll ever marry my daughter is over my dead body. What have you to say to that, eh? 
What do you have to say to that? I had plenty to say to that, naturally. My answer was a cutting, biting blow. Marrying your daughter over your dead body, sir, would give me the greatest combination of happiness that I could possibly conceive. My answer was devastating, of course. My only regret was that he'd already left and didn't hear it. However, be that as it may, Mr. Havelock's wild accusations didn't deter me in the least. I courted his daughter with the boldness, the daring, the irresistible courage of a knight errant. Good evening, sir. Uh, tell me, my good man, is Miss Agnes Havelock at home? Are you Mr. Walter Cuthbert, sir? Yes, yes, that's my name. No, sir, she's not at home. Oh, she isn't, isn't she? No, sir, she is not. Ah. Huh. Well, thank you very much. Good evening. Is Miss Agnes Havelock... No, you blithering nincompoop, she's not. Oh, thank you. No! <laughs> oh. It was several weeks later that my good friend Tom Burton came visiting me. I poured out all my troubles into his sympathetic ears. Well, if you want my opinion, Walter, you're a jackass. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I knew I could depend on... What'd you say? If you're in love with a girl, why not marry her? I explained to you, Tom, it, it's a matter of money. Well, if you made your own fortune, old man Havelock couldn't kick then, could he? No. No, of course he couldn't. But how would you suggest I go about it? You could always go to work. Work? <laughs> no. Uh, no, that wouldn't do, would it? Well, why not strike it rich somewhere? Discover oil or, or gold mines? That's it, Tom, that's it. Why, I could make a fortune overnight. I... Oh, by the way, do you have any ideas as to where I could start? Well, certainly start right here. Wonderful, I'll start right here? Sure, on your own property. But there's no gold or oil here. How do you know? Oh, it's perfectly obvious that... Have you ever prospected for any? Why, no, but... Do you have any knowledge of geological formations? Earth structures, soil compositions? I know, but I... Well, I know all about these things. You do? Certainly, certainly. During my freshman year in college, I took a full semester in geology. I know all about it. <laughs> and I can tell you right here and now, you have a perfectly magnificent terminal moraine. I have? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's just great, wonderful. It is, isn't it? Naturally, you know what a terminal moraine is. Oh, certainly, certainly why it's... Uh... Well, during the Ice Age many years ago, Walter, this part of the continent was entirely covered with a tremendous sheet of ice. Fancy that. Must have been quite chilly here. I imagine the whole... As this huge glacier moved along, now it scooped out thousands of tons of earth ahead of it, like a tremendous shovel, and after pushing that stuff along for a few thousand years, it stopped moving. Pretty tired by then, I imagine, huh? And all those tons of earth and rock were left right here, on your property, in what is known as a terminal moraine. Well, terminal moraine or not, that was a lot of nerve dumping all that stuff on my property. <laughs> Ah, but what if that glacier had dug out a bed of gold somewhere and dropped it here? Or a mountain of iron ore? Oh, well, that, that, that's, that's different, isn't it? Vastly different. Walter, I am positive that you can make your fortune, win the goodwill of Mr. Havelock, marry his daughter Agnes, and all because of your simply magnificent terminal moraine. <laughs> I was, of course, vastly encouraged by my good friend's words. Now that I was the proud owner of this, this terminal moraine, I could see my troubles being drowned in a river of flowing oil, being buried neath a mountain of golden bullion. So I plunged into the business of prospecting with a feverish energy and indomitable will. Well, Tom... What do we do now? Well, we'll need some excavating equipment, a corps of laborers, supplies, miscellaneous tools. Uh, you'll have to come up with a little cash, Walter. A, a little cash? Yes, a trifling sum should suffice. I say we could get started nicely for about uh, $5,000. $5,000? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
$5,000. But, 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 Tom... Yes, I know, I know. What are a few filthy dollars compared to the hand of lovely Agnes Havilod, huh? <laughs> uh, well, Walter? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll draw you a check at once, Tom. Almost immediately, my land was overrun with wheelbarrows, picked shovels, laborers, and piles of earth that came from countless holes that were being dug everywhere. The entire proceedings were naturally under my very capable supervision, and Tom came to me constantly for guidance and advice. Well, Walter, old man, how do you think things look? Well, I'll tell you, Tom, in my opinion... You bet they are, old man, you bet they are. <laughs> and we can keep up the good work with just a bit more cash. About 1500 should do it. We finished, ex we finished exploring the North Ridge, Walter. What next now? Well, it would seem to me the best place to try would be... Well, right... that's wonderful! I'd never have thought of that. We'll need to do some blasting there, of course. About $2,000 should take care of the equipment. Well, Walter, how far down should we drive this shaft? Well, I'd say if we drove it down... We'll do it! And it won't cost more than an extra $2,500. Yes, the work was going on apace. How lucky I was to have such a good friend as Tom who spared neither time, trouble, nor money to make my fortune. And then came the big day, the day that Tom came rushing up to me so excited he could hardly talk. Walter, Walter, old boy, I've got it, I've got it. <laughs> so I hear Tom, it's an awful cold, too. Let me suggest some warm lemonade and then possibly... Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. I've got you, your... <laughs> I've got your fortune made for you Tom, Tom, you mean we've struck it rich? What is it, Tom? Tom, oil, gold, iron ore Oh, don't be silly It's none of those common run-of-the-mill things It's something the likes of which you've never dreamed of Walter, we've struck ice <laughs> Ice? That's what I said so far as I know, Walter, you're the only man in the world who's the proud and fortunate owner of an ice mine. As Tom hurried me over to the shaft to examine our astounding discovery, I was still so dazed that most of his scientific explanation passed completely over my head. However, I did manage to retain some snatches of it. A spur of the glacier was lying on top of some caves. Massive weight broke through the roof. Ice lay buried there in the earth for thousands of years. And here it is, Walter. Millions of tons of ice on your terminal moraine. You see, Walter? Solid ice. What do you think of it now, huh? It's cold down here. That's one of the... One of... One of the natural characteristics of ice, my boy. Yeah. It's amazing, astounding, but, 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 but what, what, what of it? What of it? What of it? Walter, here under your very feet is enough ice to supply the town, the county, yes, even the state for hundreds of years. It'll make you one of the wealthiest men in the world. Now, what do you say to that? Well, that, 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 that's true, 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 Tom. Why, why there, 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 there's only one thing for me to, to, to say, and that, that is... <laughs> Once the magnitude of this tremendous stroke of good fortune penetrated my consciousness, nothing could hold me back. I rushed out of the mine to inform Agnes and Mr. Havilot at once. So impetuous was my dash over to their estate, I only paused to stop at my house for a warm bath, a hot lemonade, and a generous-sized mustard plaster for my chest. <coughs> then, thus fortified against the world, I knocked, trembling with impatience, upon their door. Yes, who is... Why, it's Mr. Cuthbert. Agnes. Agnes, my beloved. My darling. I... I beg your pardon? No longer shall the harsh barriers of differing social positions and lack of wealth keep us apart, my sweetest. We can now share our true and rightful happiness together. Mr. Cuthbert, what in the world are you saying? Just these words, my wonderful one. The most beautiful words ere spoken by man. Agnes, my angel, the glacial period and my terminal moraine <laughs> have given thee to me. <laughs> She stared at me, 
Stunned by the wonderful, unbelievably good news, her lips trembled with unspoken syllables of joy and love. And I'll never forget the words that finally passed those ruby lips. Mr. Cuthbert. Mr. Cuthbert, sir. You're crazy. I realized at once why she'd closed the door so gently against me. As a shy, modest young lady, she could scarcely be expected to reveal immediately the love she had in her heart for me. Besides, I suddenly remembered. She hadn't spoken to or even seen me since the day we first met. So, laughing gaily, I knocked upon the door once again. <laughs> oh, Agnes, my shy little dove, let me kiss away your tender little fears. Stop kissing me, you blurring idiot. <laughs> oh, it's... Mr. Havelock. Sneaking around behind my back to make love to my daughter, are you? Trying to get a first mortgage on my bank account, eh? Well, let me tell you, you fortune-hunting Casanova, I'll... Stop, I'll... Mr. Havelock, desist! Uh, Cease your nasty insinuations at once, or I'll have my bankers smash you on Wall Street. What? <laughs> You'll have your bankers do what? I'll buy out every company in which you have an interest, Mr. Havelock, and I'll break you on the wheel of high finance. You have your warning, sir. You. You'll break me. Now, shall we continue this discussion on a high plane as benefits two wealthy titans of industry? Or shall I be forced to duel you to the death in the financial marts of the world? Oh, no. No. The man must be mad. Yeah. He's stark raving mad. <laughs> no, no, Mr. Havlett. I, I merely happen to be one of the wealthiest men in the world, that's all. One of the wealthiest? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, of course you are, Mr. Cuthbert. Of course. Now, now, why don't you go to one of your money vaults and sit there counting your loose change until morning, huh? I see that you think I am joking, sir. I assure you that I am not. The sudden change in my financial status is all due to my terminal moraine. To your... <laughs> to your what? My terminal moraine. And the glacier that broke through the roof of the cave and formed my ice mine. Glacier? Ice mine? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course, Mr. Cuthbert. Agnes. Agnes. Did you call for me, Father dear? Yes, Agnes. This, this gentleman here, his mind has caved in. No, no, you... <laughs> you misunderstood me, sir. It was the cave that caved in. I mean, the glacier that was iced. Or the ice mined. The mi <laughs> you understand, don't you, Agnes? Oh, of course I do, Mr. Cuthbert. Poor dear Mr. Cuthbert. I understand everything. Thank you, Agnes, my beloved. Well, sir, then I take it I have your permission to marry your daughter? Marry my daughter? Now, you just listen to me, you adult-pated, mentally juvenile, non compass menace, you. I'll... Uh, I'll... Uh, father, dear, father, the, uh, the cave-in, remember? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, young man. If you can bring me proof of your financial status, show me how anyone can get rich through a nice mine, well, I'll not only give you Agnes, but I'll throw in a thousand gallons of fruit punch to go with your ice. Yeah. <laughs> with this very encouraging cooperation from Mr. Havelock to spur me on, I plunged into the world of high finance with vim and vigor. Once the news of my discovery spread, a continuous stream of wagons loaded with glacial ice wound their way from my enlarged mine to the railroad station, and a continuous stream of checks flowed into my bank account. I found big business to be exhilarating, entrancing, and during those times when I had to be in the mine itself, quite chilling. Now one noon hour when all the men were outside having lunch, I was down in the mine alone, inspecting my property. I was smiling to myself at the thought of Mr. Havlett's face when I finally brought him down here. And then, it happened. A section of the roof had given way. Tons of ice had fallen across the mouth of the tunnel and blocked my exit. I was buried alive in my ice mine. Naturally, I faced this horrible predicament calmly and unafraid. Help! Help! <laughs> There's no need to relate the happenings of the next four hours. With unflagging courage, I prepared myself 
before the inevitable end. And when I began to see glowing coals of fire, I was certain that end had come. I was wondering what misdeeds I could possibly have committed in the past to have ended up there when the coals burnt their way through the block of ice. A red-hot soldering iron had penetrated the block of ice. Then it was withdrawn, and I heard the voice of an angel. Mr. Cuthbert? Mr. Cuthbert, are you there? Agnes. Are Agnes, you... my beloved. You've come to my rescue. Are you crushed, Mr. Cuthbert? Why, no, I... Are you frozen? Well, a few chill blains that... Are you starved? I don't think so. Why don't you say something, Mr. Cuthbert? Why don't you say something? Hello, Agnes. <laughs> My, how lucky that I've had a college education. When I saw those soldering irons, I knew at once that they'd melt ice if they were only hot enough. <laughs> don't you think that a college education is a good thing for girls, Mr. Cuthbert? Agnes, Agnes, listen to me. I love you. And I have no desire for life or rescue unless you return that love. Speak to me, Agnes, quickly. End my unbearable suspense. Do you love me as I love you? Well, frankly, in response to your question, Mr. Cuthbert, I could only say this. Courage, Walter, old boy. Courage. We've broken through. We'll have you out of there before anyone can say yes or no. Tom was right. I was out before I heard either a yes or no from Agnes. But once above ground again, I wasted no time in seeking her out immediately. I could not bear to wait another moment before hearing her answer. So after I'd had a warm bath, a hot lemonade, and had placed yet another mustard plaster on my chest, I went after her. She was just entering the gates of her father's estate. Agnes, wait! Wait for me, my darling! Oh, oh enough of this dilly-dallying, Agnes. I must have your answer. I must. Answer, Mr. Cuthbert? To what? I surely have known how I felt about you all these long, lonely weeks, days. Well, Mr. Cuthbert, I... I confess I have. Ah, oh. Then you did hear my heart calling out to you across my 40 acres and your father's 700. No, it wasn't that. It was when you first called me Agnes rather than Miss Havelot. I knew a gentleman like you would never refer to me by my first name unless your intentions were strictly honorable. Then, then if you know, if you've known for all that time, tell me, what, what are your intentions toward me? Well, if I invite you over and to speak with my father, need you ask, Walter? Well, sir, surely by now you have sufficient proof of the existence of my ice mine. I have come to claim your daughter's hand. Stuff and nonsense! I beg your pardon? I said stuff and nonsense. Oh. <laughs> I've read every book and article on ice, glaciers, caves, and terminal moraines that I could find. And nowhere is there anything that slightly resembles your cock and bull story of a glacier tumbling into a cave and lying there waiting to be mine. But the glacier is there, sir. And, Father dear, you cannot argue against the facts. Well, confound facts. I base my arguments on sober, cool-headed reason. And there's nothing that withstands reason. Your ice mine simply does not exist. Very well, sir. But I shall continue to reap a fortune from my non-existent ice mine for the rest of my days. And I, Father dear, wish to help Walter reap his fortune for the rest of my days. So you two care nothing about reason, eh? No, sir. Not a bit of it, Father dear. All right, then. I can do no more. You might just as well go on acting like a couple of ninny hammers. Do ninny hammers marry and settle on the property? <laughs> the property adjoining yours, sir? Yes, I suppose they do. Mm. And when they find out that I'm right about that ridiculous ice mine, they can come home to a reasonable man for a little money to buy bread and butter. Well, two years have passed now. Agnes and the glacier are still mine. The ice still flows from the cave to the railroad. 
and the checks still flow into the bank. As for Agnes and myself, whether based on sound reason or ridiculous fact, nothing could make us happier than we are with our warm love and our frigid fortune as we dwell here on my terminal moraine. Alan Young and Mallor Powers for bringing us Frank Stockton's hilarious story, My Terminal Moraine. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of us owned a terminal moraine, an ice mine which would make us rich and carefree? Then, like Walter and Agnes, we could marry, raise a family, and live happily ever after, without ever giving it a thought. But such things happen only in a writer's imagination. If we really owned an ice mine, it would probably melt away from us. And if we were so thoughtless as to base a marriage on it, I'm afraid the marriage would soon melt away too. We of Family Theater believe that a marriage needs a much stronger foundation. Yes, we really believe that marriages are made in heaven. We believe that a man and woman who vow to love, honor, and obey one another need God's constant help if they are to be faithful to their promises. We believe that a family can grow in love and mutual understanding only by believing in God and living as he taught us. That is why we urge you each week to make faith and prayer a part of your daily life, a part of your marriage, and a part of your home. For the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you Alan Young in my Terminal Moraine with Patricia Neal as your hostess. Others in our cast from Alla Powers, Ken Christie, and Robert North. This adaptation of Frank Stockton's whimsical classic was written by Sidney Marshall, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman and directed for Family Theater by Jaime Dovay. These Family Theater broadcasts are made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program and by the mutual network which has responded to this need. This is Gene Baker inviting you to be with us next week at this time when your family theater will bring you Edmund O'Brien and Gene and June Lockhart in The Adventures of Robin Hood. Join us, won't you? This program came from Hollywood. For a daytime drama of family life, hear the romantic against the storm, carried over the mutual line, and most likely heard every week over the station to which you are now listening. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.